And now, Hollywood Prospectus. Hello and welcome to the Hollywood Prospectus Podcast. My name is Chris Ryan. I am a writer for Greatland.com and on the other line, standing at the end of the George Washington Bridge with a boombox saying, Welcome to New York City! It's Andy Greenwald. Is that your Halloween voice? Yeah! That was cute. I like that. Happy Halloween, man. What are you going as this year? You've been, um, I, I'm glad you asked that. I'm going to be going as a tired 30 something. How about you? <laughs> I'm, I'm going as, uh, as David Milch. Oh, that's good. That's good for you. So for that costume where you just lie recumbent on I'm a couch. I'm going to wear a mock turtleneck and swear. Yeah, just, no, but hold a mini tape recorder and just yell swears. Yeah. Yeah, man. Hey, yeah, you're a big Halloween guy. You, are, are you going to dress up? Are you going to go to a party? What are you going to do? No, I just like, I, I enjoy scary movies. The, the process of actually handing out candy is a little bit tiresome after, after a while. Yeah, but I mean, that's, that's, that's more of a passive role. I, I thought I maybe you'd be like. I personally enjoy dressing up. I just like the pageantry. <laughs> uh, Andy. You don't personally enjoy dressing up. In the grand the tradition mm. of. So, mm. well, first, let me just mention today on the podcast, we'll be talking about uh, uh, Birdman. Taylor Swift's new album, 1989, and maybe a little bit later we'll get to some depressing television. I mean, if we're if you're lucky, if listeners. you're lucky, take your Xanax. But in the meantime, in the yeah. grand tradition of such podcast episodes as yeah. Dark Knight Rises, mm-hmm. The Born Legacy, and Prometheus, Andy and Chris, if I may speak about us in the third person, saw a movie at the same time. Just not together, but like we saw a movie. The same movie, and we're going to talk about it. You meant that Birdman? The movie? <laughs> I thought you meant number one stunner. <laughs> we're going to talk about what happened to that boy. This I, is the oral history. I have five hot takes on what happened to that boy. I thought this was going to be a real... I, I was curious when you were like, can that we would do... Actually, what happened to that boy would be a pretty good uh, subtitle for Birdman. What happened to that boy would be a good subtitle to Broadchurch or Grace Point or <laughs> literally true. every TV show that we're going to be talking about at the end of the hour. That's um, true. Mad Men. Mad, yeah, seriously. Look, I thought it was weird when you wanted to do like a hot 20 on Southern rap, but this is our show. We do what we want. No, Chris, I saw a movie. Yeah, man. I saw a movie. Uh, first run movie in a theater. Just just straight up went to a movie on Friday. Podcast guest fell through. I went. It was a good experience. We saw Birdman. Birdman. Feels good to say it. Is it is it Birdman or is it Birdman? <laughs> like Larry Birdman. Um, you want to explain it to people? I, I think I, that I'm just having fun watching you try to organize your thoughts about something that lasted two hours that you saw in a dark room with other people. That I saw three days ago. Are you? Did you know what I did this weekend? I went to a botanical garden. <laughs> I have I have so many flowers in my mind that are ahead of the movie. But you you set me up. I'll, I'll uh, roll. Yeah. So for anybody who doesn't know, Birdman is the latest from uh, Mexican director Alejandro Gonzalez. Inarritu. Inarritu. And he has directed this film starring Michael Keaton, Edward Norton, Emma Stone, Naomi Watts, Amy Ryan, Zach Galifianakis, and Andrea Riseborough. Nice. Off the uh, dome. Yeah. Just, that's just the IMDB in the mind. And it's about a sort of the twilight of a, of a one-time 90s blockbuster star uh, named Regan Thompson, played by Keaton, who was in a Batman-like movie back in the, the 90s, a yep. uh, blockbuster trilogy. He left that behind, slash sort of suffered from the inevitable peaks and valleys of fame, and now finds himself on the Great White Way, uh, Andy's favorite street. Um, <laughs> trying to re- reinvent himself. Getting, yeah. Trying to reinvent himself as a th- stage actor, producing, directing, writing, funding, giving his heart and soul to an adaption of Raymond Carver's What We Talk About When We Talk About Love. Which is just, you know, in terms of modern Broadway, that is just audience bait. And uh, Andy, in, in the process of, of staging this play, Keaton's character, they lose their co-star, this guy named Ralph, and they hire an actor named Mike Shiner, played by Edward Norton. Now, <clears throat> I know you just want to clear your throat, because I know you want to go full Norton for the next 20 minutes. And believe me, this, this film and this performance deserves the pause and the full Norton. Um, we got we to gotta find our way into this because this is being heralded as one of, if not the best movies of the year. It is absolutely, without question, one of the most exciting, dynamic, surprising, 
movies of the year. And I say that as someone who has seen twos of movies this year. <laughs> it's good, man. It's, it's a good movie. Um, let's talk about... See, my reaction to this was... was I, I loved a lot. You came of out of the movie. movie, you texted me, you said, I have a, a lot that I loved and a lot that I hated. I did. I think I loved more than I hated, um, which is really what, you know, let's just say that's, that's all you want on your gravestone at the end of, end of your long life. But um, let's talk with, with, let's talk about the loves first. Okay. And I would say that this was a movie that reminded me how great good actors can be. Yes. When they are invested and they are alive and what they can do with material that was very good and exciting for them. But when they find their way into the material, it is electric. And, you know, a lot of attention is being rightly paid to the direction. A lot of attention is being rightly paid to um, Chivo Lubezki, who is basically the god of cinema at this point, because he's the cinematographer who made Gravity with his other um, compatriot from Mexico um, uh, two years ago. And uh, Alfonso Cuaron is that other guy's name. Sorry about that. <laughs> Alfonso and Cuaron family. Uh, and this movie he shot basically to look like one unedited take. Mm -hmm. And so visually it is absolutely astounding. But what, we, what I want to talk about is how that visual electricity is in service to these crazy good performances. Sure. Now, you feel yeah. free to do that for me. Um, I think that there are a lot of movies that can, that feel actor friendly. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I don't know that I've ever seen one that explored the entire sort of fallacy and also honesty and truth of acting. You know what I mean? Like, I've never really, in any earnest way, I tried acting. But it, uh, this movie really did a good job at getting at the, at the sort of hilarious... The, the hilarious, like, things, the, the, the most ridiculous things that actors can be doing and the most beautiful things that actors can be doing. And one of the most insane things that you'll see in this screen, in, on the screen, I think other people have pointed this out, is the amount of times that these actors not only have to be playing the part that they're playing. So Edward Norton plays a guy named Mike Shiner. He plays a guy named Mike Shiner who is in a play. And then he also has to sometimes play a guy named Mike Shiner who's in a play who's pretending to be drunk. I mean, there's sometimes like four or five performances going on at once right. there, including times where they are almost, for our purposes, intentionally acting poorly for because of whatever's happening in their personal lives. So as like a, just a complete celebration of the art form of acting. It's kind of wild because it's been so much so much has been said about the cinematography and the sort of kinetic yeah. direction and the virtuistic camera work but it's kind of you know if you want to see something that that's about acting go see birdman well chris as you know having sat through my memorable performance as man in <laughs> howard quarter's Not birdman. Uh, boy's life um in which i attempted to extract my coat from a room at a party in 1997 you know that you know i really relate to the actor's mindset and um i i found it, especially the first half of the movie, when everything's coming together and they're performing their lives and they're performing their roles, it's, I mean, I said this word before, but the movie is electric. And the best special effect of the year, I think, is Emma Stone's face. I think that she is an incredible performer. I've always thought she was really good, but I thought, her, I thought that what she did in this movie with what really could be a throwaway nothing part, because the idea of the, you know, the sort of the, the petulant daughter who maybe had some substance abuse issues, who is very much in the thrall and in service to her father, even though the movie's sort of about reversing that dynamic. Mm -hmm. Everything she does is basically in reaction to him. Uh, what she brought to that part is kind of revelatory. There's a scene where he, I mean, I don't know, we haven't really just, I don't know how much we're going to talk about it. We don't need to get, we can maybe throw up a spoiler or something before we get too specific. Yeah, well, I mean, end. like, let's, I mean, it's basically like he's trying to produce this play, hoping that it, Gives his career some sort of critical and everlasting relevance. Well, validation. And validation. Too. And, yeah. And there's a scene in which she turn he he accuses her of basically potentially sabotaging this effort. And she turns it around on him. And she just rips him to shreds in a way that I believe only family members possibly can. Mm -hmm. And the camera just you know, for the camera that is dancing and moving to this incredible drum score for the entire movie, it just holds on her face. And it's almost overwhelming. Yeah. The way that she sells that scene and what her eyes do in that scene. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's pretty, it's impressive when, when filmmaking that is capable of pyrotechnics is able to take a backseat to actual human based 
um, emoting. They, I don't know what lens he uses, but the actors look enormous in this. Yeah, movie. it's like fish eyes, kind well, of. I mean, it's I, almost it, like the way they people looked in westerns. Like their their bodies are these gigantic statues against the New York City skyline. Yeah, and 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 Norton, who you have long celebrated on this podcast and in your personal life, is so he's so good and you know again like everything else there are a lot of ins like everything else in the movie his performance is something of an inside joke i mean obviously michael keaton walked away from the batman movies and has been notably silent in terms of his mainstream career for quite some time and norton has a reputation for being a method lunatic and insisting on changing everything that he's in and rewriting it and mike shiner has a lot of those characteristics too and norton to his great credit owns it you who know? is mike shiner supposed to be is it mark rylance is it oh, like who are the, I, like, is there any theater actor so. who's like turning down Hollywood? No, I mean uh, yes, probably. But here, here, I mean you're you're steering me too early, maybe into my into my criticism well, let me, of let it. Let me maybe now we praise Edward Norton. Then I was hoping you would. Okay. no one praises. Listen, in this Mrs. movie, Mama Norton does not praise Eddie Norton like you do. In this movie, Edward Norton is his own weather system. Like he comes in, the sun comes out. Like this movie comes completely alive when he comes on the screen. He, in the first ten minutes, I think, um, like does does this audition for Michael Keaton, gets the part, takes all his clothes off, flirts yeah, with that. Michael Keaton's daughter, uh, has some ribald dialogue with Naomi Watts, then gets drunk and gets into a huge fight with like three different people. You know what I mean? Like he's. I think he hurls a chicken carcass at yeah, the audience moving too. Moving through this movie like with 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 like just torrential winds, and uh, what what you kind of see with him is this is this is the perfect role for him because Edward Norton's always at his best when he is the spoiler, with the exception of American History X and Twenty Fifth Hour. Almost all the roles that he's done where he's been great mm -hmm. are the ones where he basically snatches some dude's wig, in the Rounders, rounders yeah. in. Uh, Born Legacy. Born Legacy. Um, in Primal Fear, which was sort of the role that really blew him up. He's always the second person who just completely snatches that movie from the other from the mm -hmm. star. Uh, and that's what the and that's what his role in within the play is. Yeah, I mean, exactly. The it's is the about perfect. And in, in some ways, it seems like it was written for him, but he has so much energy. And and you know, Keaton's very much like twitchy, and it's all like kind of being tightened around the, you know, it's like somebody's got his, their hands around his throat the whole movie. But Norton ha doesn't have those problems. I mean, Norton's already free. And even if that freedom costs him relationships and maybe professional advancement, both, you know, I, I, I couldn't say for his personal life, but definitely in the world of this film, you get the sense like this is a guy who knows that he's never really going to be able to fully make it because of what his self-destructive qualities. So he's going to sort of live on the like, that's the guy who keeps it 100 all the time reputation yeah, that he has. Live on the legend. Yeah. Um, there's this great part where, um, you know, there's this the sort of heavy, if there is one of the movie, is this New York Times theater critic, which um, is played by. I Lin have some thoughts about Lindsay Duncan. And yeah. there's a great scene in Sardi's where they, Michael Keaton and Edward Norton go in there for a drink, which they're supposed to be drinking coffee, but they have a drink. And he walks over, Norton walks over to Lindsay Duncan and says, basically, like, you know, says hello, but in a very sarcastic way. And he says, she says, what, aren't you scared that I'm going to give you a bad review? Because he's been giving her, he's been busting her chops a little bit. And she's like, aren't you ever scared that I'm going to give you a bad review? And he's like, I'm never going to give you a bad performance. So you can't. And it's like this incredibly cocky, but just kind of sad moment between these people where it does like, that's all they have to go on in their lives are these sort of principles that they live by. Well, and, and Keaton, sorry, sorry to jump in, but I, I feel like Keaton, it, in the in the within the movie, Riggin Thompson is uncomfortable about ceding the spotlight to this other actor who demands more and more of it. Keaton is such a fascinating performer because he does not seem to have that problem at all. He is the dude, the, the aging dude that still has the fastball, and he, you know, never. We've talked. A, I feel like we've talked a bunch recently about leading men, movie stars, and character actors, mm -hmm. and how we were talking about the Nick, like Clive Owen looks like a leading man, but he really performs like a character actor, which is why he's so well-suited to the Nick and maybe not so well-suited to movies like Duplicity. Sure. Um, Keaton 
never looked like a leading man, but has this intense intensity and charisma that allowed him to be one. He almost doesn't work as a supporting actor. He's too much. He's too much. And so now uh, he certainly doesn't look like a leading man. I mean, his the skin on his face is kind of a supporting actor in this. Like the, like the, the, the sort of weather beaten cheeks and the, the folds by his ears. I mean, we spend a lot of time close up on that face. Yeah, I mean, it's, and it's in contrast to the fact that it looks like Edward Norton has been sleeping under a golden Grecian fleece <laughs> yeah. for the last 20 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he looks about as good as he looked in Rounders. He, he probably Watts has more ex- hair, honestly. And, and Naomi Watts looks exactly the same as she did 15 years ago. Yeah, and I mean, people, and she's, and it should be said that if there's anything that's, she, she has like, she doesn't get a lot of time in this movie, but the scenes that she gets are pretty incredible. She's really good. Um, she's, yeah, she's really, really good. And my, pr- I guess here, okay, ahead, here's the thing. Go ahead and talk to me about what you, don't, what you didn't like about it. I don't think I felt I, as strongly the other way, so I'm going to be curious to hear what you have to say. I didn't feel so strong. I mean, <clears throat> in general, I think that for a movie that was so sly and playful and clever and dynamic and fun... And was lit, you know, it's a very, very cheap analogy, but I'll make it um, for a movie that really is soaring and flying mm-hmm. for the first three quarters, first two acts. There really is no place to go for it to land. Did you notice um, when it stopped soaring? W- literally? Yeah, because it's pretty much when Norton leaves the. I, and I'm not even saying this is biased. Like I'm saying, when they take Norton out of the narrative, kind of, yeah. it sort of loses its momentum. Well, because it, the thing is about them, it, it, it becomes kind of the visuals become less conventional because it gets a little more surreal. Mm-hmm. But the the narrative of this self deluding, you know, guy who sort of sees himself as the martyr in his own story and needs the validation of the world to the you know while still sort of punishing Amy Ryan as his ex wife and Emma Stone who plays his daughter to some degree, where he's still the hero and the star. That felt a lot more formulaic to me, and it felt a little lumpy where it ended. So. That's not really my critic- my biggest criticism. My biggest problem with the movie was Lindsay Duncan as the New York Times theater critic. Interesting. Because for a movie that was very smart and in the know and wink wink about a lot of things, you know, the, the Birdman is a fictional uh, franchise, but there's a lot of references to like Ryan Gosling and George Clooney, and it's very much set in contemporary real world. They get the apocalypse porn stuff right for sure. Yeah, and even when they go into the special, actual bring in special effects, it's there and sort of the you know that it's all very present of the moment. Um, it really bummed me out, and obviously I have a, a horse in this race, but it really bummed me out how re- how incredibly stupid and myopic, I guess, in Yurito's in Yurito's view of criticism is, because I think there is a, and I, I certainly get this a lot, you know, on, on Twitter and other places, but. There's a fundamental misunderstanding of what criticism is that is reflected in this movie in that in Birdman, Lindsay Duncan's character who writes for the New York Times seeks to destroy something for her own motives. Mm-hmm. She tells Michael Keaton she's going to destroy his play sight unseen because he doesn't belong on Broadway, where Broadway is a place for real actors and real art. Of course, you know, they filmed it actually on Broadway and the Carver adaptation is playing in the theater next to Motown the musical. So... You know, I guess she doesn't actually review all of the shows in the fictional Broadway, but whatever. The truth is, at least, and I'll just speak from my experience, the reason people write about art forms or about art is because they love them. Mm-hmm. And when I write a negative review of something, it's not because I want to destroy something. It's because in terms of what I love and I want things to be better, this did not meet those, this did, this did not reach that level. I, I really only write negative things when I, you know, when I'm sensing a certain kind of like cynicism or um, or just incompetence, you know, that's something that I think should be done better or taken more seriously. And so the fact that the, 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 the biggest conflict of the movie is the scene between Keaton and Lindsay Duncan where they yell at each other and he's like, you are nothing, you are a zero, I put my she soul out there. Well, she just sits there smugly sipping a martini, twirling her, her, her mustache. She is, a, she is a non-real thing. She is, I, she is more fictional than Birdman. Okay, I, I didn't read it quite so much as Inaratu's specific like it i didn't necessarily port that onto the to the director like i didn't necessarily think that oh this is what the director thinks i thought that if anything it was an anachronistic portrait of a critic because i don't think critics have that much power anymore 
Yeah, that's um, the other thing. Thank you for that. Very good point. If anything, the one real Achilles heel of the movie was its sort of understanding of modern media. I mean, the, I, the Emma Stone Oof. speech you pointed out was cool, but she does say, like, you hate bloggers and you don't have a Facebook page. And it, it did feel sort of tacked on. Yeah. You're a trending topic Dad. to an earlier version of the screenplay. And then they were like, we need something that, you know, go, that talks about going viral and having bloggers. It's just it felt like very like. Uh, focus group to me. I mean, I'm sure it wasn't, but it just didn't feel like a, of a part of the rest of the screenplay. As for the scene you're talking about itself, she sort of reminded me of a earlier iteration of critics that I don't think you see very much of anymore. And if you that do, there are people like, say, Armand White, you know what I mean, who are kind of trolls. But like whether it's Clement Greenberg or some of the rock critics from the 70s and early okay, 80s, yeah. like uh, Richard Meltzer, who are literally like I have a very defined idea of what constitutes good art in the in the medium that I'm evaluating. And 85 to 95 percent of it falls short. Well, and, and I'm a gatekeeper. And I I'm say what gets in and what, now, and what doesn't. And, that, and that, that was something that I think that like you used to read. I mean, people talk about trolling and bad reviews now which are, are fairly rare i think because everybody is i think it's a pretty pretty genial you know in terms of like when movies come out or when tv shows come out people try to find the good if they bother writing about it at all it used to in my experience my memory of criticism is is much more withering my dad used to be the film critic at the philadelphia inquirer and i remember very good one 90 percent of what he wrote about was just like he was just giving the middle finger to stuff because it was just granted a lot of it was crap but he had very like snooty taste and he just was like, this is I'm not going to give this a pass. I'm not going to say it's good for what it is. I'm not going to say I liked parts of it. He was just like, this isn't good enough. If 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 we're capable of making Godfather 2, if we're capable of making Chinatown or Citizen Kane, like or the Born Legacy. Yeah. Or the Born Legacy movies that fall drastically short of that get called out. And I think that that was sort of what she was to me. Is, is what the, uh, the Tabitha character is. In, I, in I think that is a very smart and very nuanced take on something that I had a much stronger... Yeah, you had a visceral reaction to it. Visceral reaction to it. And I, and I, that absolutely does come from and my experience And I actually don't think that Michael Keaton's argument towards her makes much sense, where he's like, you just label things. It's like, well, nobody actually thinks people just label things. I understand the whole thing is like, you know, those that don't, those that do, do, and those that can't teach or whatever. It's like the same thing applied yes. to criticism. If you can't make art, you must cr critique it and work out your, you know, childhood, childish resentment at your own inability through your criticism. But I don't find that that's very much the case anymore. I don't think people are like, oh, I wish I could write screenplays. Since I can, I'm just going to rip on movies. Yeah, because at the people who can. I mean, I think you do see some of that stuff, but not very much of it. Right. And, and, you know, I mean, I, what I, I like writing about TV because I like writing, first of all. And so I'm trying to make my own trying to make something that TV exists. you're sort of neither here nor there about, but the writing part you like. <laughs> uh, exactly. Yeah. I love writing. It's such a blast. No, but I mean, when I, when I do the work, the, you, the goal is to make something that, that stands on its own as a valid piece of writing, sure. not just in response to something else. And it's because, you know, in, I really care about story and I care about construction of things and storytelling. And, you know, so, so that definitely rubbed me the wrong way, but also because I think the, the bigger point that it did seem like the moments referring to trending topics and viral videos, it did take me out of a narrative that otherwise felt very grounded in some ways, you know, that, I, I, that felt also, very much tied to a moment. I hear you. And I think that that scene on, from that scene on, you kind of lose, I, I'm not so sure how much the camera is a reliable narrator from that scene on. That's true. And, I, and I, I, so I'm just not suggesting that that scene didn't happen in, in the real reality, quote unquote. But <laughs> it, the movie doesn't definitely the magical realism gets ramped up as the and, movie goes on from there. And I think you if you could have been listening to this, us talk about this so far and, and, and having not seen the movie and not be spoiled. So I'm going to start talking about something very specific at the end. If you don't want to hear about it, just scrub forward a few seconds and then wait until you hear Chris singing Shake It Off by Taylor Swift, the third <laughs> verse, and then you can start press play again. Um I also really hated the gun in the third act um, only because it felt show offy and forced in a way to sort of raise the stakes. You know, I, I thought it was kind of more interesting and maybe a little bit tougher in some ways if he had done the show and had the reaction. The fact that I, I get why the gun happened and why then the review Again, a very stupid review that real blood has been returned to the theater, so now he's a great artist. And then, of course, the ultimate irony is that he's now trapped by this, much as he was trapped by 
uh, Birdman. But that is one of those choices that, again, I, I, the thing I like about this movie is because there were a lot of, a lot of pretty bold choices made. That was one reach that I, that pulled me out. I don't know. How how do you, how did you feel about the, I feel like the movie movie. ended like three times. Yeah. Um, A lot of movies do that these days. Yeah. And I'm not sure. Like, it doesn't bother me that, Okay, so the the film feels fairly like grounded in physics for the despite the fact that there's telekinesis involved. <laughs> I enjoyed part yeah. like how like I really liked, for instance, how it takes place basically over uh, the course of a block on 45th Street, but right outside of MTV towards was that Seventh District. Avenue? It's there? on Broadway, yeah, Eighth Avenue, and. Uh, I, it felt very geog- like rooted in, in a geography, like a real geography. And then at the end to have it be like he shot himself with a 45, but either intentionally or unintentionally blew his own nose off. But his nose is actually fine. It's just broken. Well, no, they gave him a new nose. They did put a new nose on him. I thought he was like, we're going to get you a new nose. Oh, I think they I think this was after the nose surgery. OK, well, which wasn't apparently sure, happened but overnight. I don't know. Yeah, it was a little unclear as and, and, you know, the end is just sort of like kind of it kind of it kind of drifts off instead of making a final statement. Yeah, because I don't think I don't know where it goes. It said some interesting things and it's and, and you know, that that final knife twist where where Galifianakis, who's very good in the movie, too, we should say that um, is is reading the review and basically saying now you're going to be doing this on tour and you're going to be selling to you know you are going to become a franchise for this thing that was supposed to be the art and it's a pretty damning if not altogether unfamiliar idea that you know that if we seek validation constantly from others then they continue to have all the power over us regardless of what right. it is that we do um that point landed was Riggin actually a beautiful soul that that could fly into the air? I I I mean, it, it, I like ambiguity. I like that idea of that, and I love the last image. But it didn't, like you said, it it didn't bring it home. It it kept the drummer kept drumming. I feel like that movie could have gone finish. on for another hour, and it would have just I, it wouldn't have had any more of like a firm end point. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? So I, I, anyway, I I we obviously highly recommend it. It, yeah, it was exciting to see. It was interesting. It's it, it's been interesting to see the few like f this movie reviews. I saw one on the dissolve. I've seen others. What, have, did, what are people saying? I have not. I've read that anything. It's yet. completely overblown, and that this is just that, that Inaratu just thinks that he's the first person who ever thought that like criticism was bad or Twitter was destructive or whatever. You know, you know what I mean? Like, I, I'm not trying to assign that to the dissolve review, but the reviews that I've seen I, have been sort me, of like this guy is, is full of hot air. Let me throw one thing on here. This may be a relic. This may be an old, old heater from from back when we used to see movies together more often, but like from the time we saw Gravity and mm. talked about it. But especially in the early days of a movie that people love, let's not be so quick to discount wonder. Because, sure. you know, Gravity, if you rip that script apart, or if you even just read the script, it is very, very basic. No bueno. It is... It is very often trite. Um, and even if you, you know, if you watch the movie on like your phone instead of a giant movie screen, it's its effect is diminished. But I s- will still stand by that movie as being one of the most incredible and beautiful experiences I've had in the theater. I mean, it was inc- it was astonishing to watch. And so the visual imagination, which is, you know, not something that I often spend time thinking about, because in TV, it's really often more about the writing and the story and the plot. But the visual imagination shown by these, and they called themselves the Three Amigos for a while, but for Coron and Yuritu and, and um, uh, um, Del, Toro. You know, Del Toro, who's now on TV, is really unparalleled. And what, what, and what Chivo Lubezki does as a cinematographer for them is, is inspiring. I mean, it's exciting. It's so, cool stuff, man. And it's I, also, I, I, I just like, I love watching actors flex. Yeah, this was a flex zone. This was this a flex contra zone. Contra the song, Birdman is pure flex zone. That's <laughs> our, that, put that on the poster. Let's end it there. Uh, Andy, we're going to take a quick break from a word from our sponsor. We'll be right back. Mike Tyson Mysteries premieres October 27th at 10.30 p.m. Eastern, 9.30 Central on Adult Swim. Mike Tyson is done with boxing. Now the champ and his team, a talking pigeon, a ghost, and his adopted Korean daughter 
or out solving mysteries, just like Scooby-Doo. He's even got his own mystery van. Join Mike as he punches dinosaurs, leprechauns, and astronauts on the moon. The all-star vo voice cast includes the real Mike Tyson, Norm MacDonald as a talking pigeon, and Jim Rash from Community. To celebrate the show, Adult Swim is hosting a nationwide scavenger hunt for 100 limited edition Mike Tyson mini statues on October 25th through 27th. To find out if the scavenger hunt is coming to your city, go to ourmysteriesreal.com. Just like Scooby-Doo! And we're back! And so is Taylor Swift. Yeah, man. Let's let's talk. Let's join the let's zeitgeist. Let's tango in the night, dog. What's going on? Let's get in this conversation. I, this morning, why is Jack Antonoff out here like Mr. Thanksgiving feeding the streets these hits? I, 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 I tried to tell people about that dude on my podcast. I tried to tell people. He was me, ready to okay, bring before it. we talk about Taylor Swift's 1989 album, which is which is out this week. I want to ask you. Yeah. Are you where are you on the on the side of? Are you in these Taylor Wars? Are you pro Taylor? No, con Taylor. Do you care? I care. I think she's fantastic. She's great. Taylor Swift is great. Really? Her songs are great. Her albums are great. <laughs> I buy them on iTunes and have them downloaded to you my phone and devices. Them. Did you? Let me tell you about. Let me tell you about this morning. Wow. Let me tell you a little something about this morning. This morning, six six ish. Reached over to my phone just to see what time it was. See where I, I was at with my sleep cycle and my day. And it was time to get up. You know why, Chris? Because Taylor Swift had dropped. Because there was an icon on my phone that said, some materials you have pre-purchased are ready for download. You pre-ordered 1989? Because I wanted that Antonoff fire early. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted wow. your Out of the Woods as a jam. I wanted to hear it. I wanted it's to be part of the conversation. When I'm like, I'm pretty into something. And you're like, I'm really into something. I'm, I'm, I'm a guilty remnant for I don't this. understand what's surprised about this. Because earlier today, I G-chatted you and I was like, Taylor Swift record is really good. Yeah, but we because probably I thought don't want to talk about like, that. I thought you were like ghost riding it. I thought you were like watching from yeah. afar. I, you want to know what my favorite deep cuts on Red are? I mean, I like Taylor <laughs> Swift. You know why? Because she writes good pop songs. Yep. And that's what I like. And 1989 is a graduate level seminar <laughs> in how to write good pop songs. She is. She's the Walter Benjamin of Red. Because it's not, it's not just her, Chris. Uh-huh. And not just our man Jack Antonoff, who can write some pop songs himself. No, it's the god Shellback. It's my men's, Max <laughs> Martin and Shellback, who continue to be the most interesting people in the world that no one write about. No one writes about. But these are the dudes who in people Sweden write about them. People they, they, they get a lot of credit. I, they get credit, but I don't think anyone. I don't think they you give they access. Also get think, guap. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they get. They get. They get a lot. I mean, I. I. I all the cheese. I was going to start naming Swedish cheese varietals but i don't think they need that they just get like the, the eurozone cheese. eurozone cheese yeah that's swiss cheese you're thinking of that's the one with holes this there you are no holes <laughs> in max martin's game you're fired okay? up this is your because mike shiner this, rant because these dudes write incredible songs so you and then you were like yeah we're not going to talk about that i didn't say 17 that. I minutes said I later listened to it late yet and then i and then i fired up out of the woods and i was i was saved yeah. Then you understood what the icons on your on your emojis. You understood the flames emoji. You understood the one hundred emoji, and you understood the monkey cupping its ears, being like, "Play it louder." <laughs> that's what you. That's what you went through this morning. And what I can only imagine was like seven thirty seven on the West Coast, and you were sipping a green juice smoothie. Do you think that people like? Do we need to chill out a little bit though? Because I saw someone out there being like, "Yo, Out of the Woods has clips grinding drums." And yeah, it's like, let's all calm down. Settle Look, down. You know what I mean? Like, you, let, let, what you asked me was, do I have, am I in these wars? Like, that is a stupid thing. Do you know what there are in the world? Real war. Okay. You know what I mean? Okay. Like, this is not a thing to argue about. I feel like people use Taylor Swift and hate her for various reasons that have nothing to do with the fact that these are great pop songs. That's it. Like, I, I actually don't believe in using her as an avatar to, like, or, or, or a, a millstone to, to, sorry, clips, to grind your own personal <laughs> stuff. Sorry, sorry, Pusha. Sorry, Pusha. Sorry. I have so much to apologize to him for. But, but you know what I mean? Like, like they, I, I thought um, our man uh, John Caramonica in The Times wrote the first review of 1989 last week, and it is an outstanding piece. And I think he absolutely nailed it. Did John like the record? I don't, <laughs> did he? Yeah. John liked the record. But John also wrote I know, something I mean, I really the smart. Review. I just didn't come away with it being like, man, John thinks this is fire. No, no, I'm not saying he was, he, he, you're right, he definitely did not think it was fire. He thought it was maybe like like a little bit like sputtering flames, like like an old Bic lighter you find in your bedside table. Yeah, but what I'm saying like is, pocket lint in it. but what he did say that was really smart 
was that she is not trying to compete with the dominant diva mode of today. And that was why she's really smart, because she's winning a war. Sorry, there I go again. She's winning a fight that no one else is participating in. She is not trying to co-opt R&B or hip hop. She's not trying to compete with Beyonce. What she's doing is channeling a kind of pop radio that's right there in the title of the record, like late 80s, early 90s pop radio. The heyday of Janet Jackson, Paul Abdul, uh, Taylor Dane. Yep. You know, and, and even like I, I have my, one of my most distinctive memories of my childhood is uh, I was on this uh, traveling all stars uh, baseball team. No, no big deal. Like like traveling around the country. Like, no, what, traveling what, what? around Philadelphia. <laughs> It's like we had some whistle stop tour, like a presidential candidate no, in 1897, from town to town. Okay, <laughs> like Woody Guthrie, uh, bringing baseball to the folk. Uh, no, we, I was on his baseball team. We had a lot of like games all over the city, so there's long car rides, and you know it was m- largely the transportation was provided by mothers, and um, you know we would all pile into these these station wagons or whatever. And I have very, very distinctive memories of just kind of being like exhausted after a game or really hyped before a game, sitting in the back seat and having, you know, Eagle 106 or Q102 playing um, and uh, hearing stuff like Angel by Aerosmith. You know what I mean? Like just like very big pop songs. Wild Wild West by Escape Club. Um, (laughs) Just don't don't shut me down. I'll get over you. Is that Go West? (laughs) Oh, King no, of Wishful, uh, King thinking. Of Wishful Thinking. Yeah, 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 that's right. That is an all-timer. I'm putting that on our Spotify playlist right now, yeah. Doesn't really sound like Taylor Swift, but my point being is that I was, I have a very, cl- like, it, very it fond not. memory for soft, like, hard pop, soft rock like this. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I don't really know what to say. Like, I don't, I, she she has, like, she's just got, she's addicted to hooks. Like, I, it's it's kind of crazy. Yeah, I, and, I, and I think There's, that like, six number one singles on here. Yes, and that's fantastic. I can't wait to hear them forever, you know? And I think that the, one of the things that is very frustrating about music and the way music is covered is because music is so intensely personal and subjective, the the high-low art debate still rages within it. The Clement like, Greenberg debate, <laughs> yeah, no less. You're really making friends and influencing people with this podcast. Um, <laughs> rages in music in a way that it doesn't in other forms. Like, I think that, and it did, it used to everywhere, but for example, like in the food world, right? Like we can celebrate like Farron Adria and, and, and the Spanish masters of molecular gastronomy. And we can also say the burger at Shake Shack is dope mm-hmm. because it is, a, it is a good example of the form and a good burger is great. And I feel like even on TV, I don't get that much guff from people because my readers are not 97 years old, but also because, <laughs> you know, I can talk about, we, or we can talk, we, on the show, we could talk about Top of the Lake and Rectify, okay? And then we could also talk about, I don't know, like, uh, w- w- give me, give me a, give me some, give me a silly comedy. I mean, we could talk about, I mean, I, I, I the fact that I'm, I'm having trouble New calling girl, something silly. Project, whatever, yeah. Yeah, or happy endings. Like, I think those are expertly made. They're trying to do different things and we can appreciate that. Yeah. So I'm saying, like, for people who want to enjoy the new Scott Walker Sun O album or whatever, like, please go do that. But you leave Taylor alone. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> I don't really know if we have much more to add to that. Uh, just, just what's your jam? I just want to, what's your jam? I think Out of the Woods. You spend any time with blank space? I'm kind of also into style. <laughs> really? Yeah. That's like the tango in the night joint, right? Yeah. Yeah, there's, I mean... The truth is, it's called Molly 1989. Molly compared, today on her piece on Graylin, Molly compared some of this stuff to, like, that, that secret garden Bruce. I'm down with that. Listen, <laughs> when people, t- like, when I talked to Lindsey Buckingham a few weeks ago, and we were talking about some of the stuff he did in the 80s, production on, like... He was uh, like, I ain't got <laughs> on Taylor. <laughs> he basically. No, I mean, I should have brought it up, but, like, Go Insane era or Tango in the Night. I didn't bring this up. I think a lot of people talk to him. One of the questions is, like, if you could just take a mulligan on some of that 80s production... Like, would you do that? And would you, quote unquote, save the songs from that? Like now he does Big Love, which was on Tango in the Night by Fleetwood Mac. He does it as this very intense solo acoustic song. You know, There's and nothing so I think wrong some with people, Tango in the Night. But that's what I'm saying. That I, because maybe it's because we grew up on it. But you know, it's some, one of the most immaculately tinny, produced records I've ever heard. And you get me some tinny synths. <laughs> you get me some, you get me some, some synthy drums. You get me an album whose guiding light is this soundtrack to the original Mario Kart, okay? Like, you get me that sound. All I'm trying to do on Tango in the Night when I remaster that is to just just take take down them Christine McVie vocals. What? You, you know how I feel about this. No, I don't. That's the that's the most outrageous thing you've here ever the, said on this Here's podcast. the Fleetwood Mac power rankings. 
Lindsay, Stevie, nobody. Wow. I don't Whoa, I can't you are mess so with any wrong. McVee tracks. Oh, I would rather no. listen to drum solos than Christine McVee's tracks. First of all, we're talking Tango of the Night, two best songs on it, Christine's songs, Everywhere and Little Lies. No question. Didn't she write Gypsy? What's Gypsy's on Tango, isn't it? A, no. B, that's Stevie. <laughs> I know who sings it, but I'm saying, what's, what, what album is Gypsy on? Mirage. Oh. Dude, basic. Basic. Come on. Look, Christine, you can't have Fleetwood Mac without Christine. I do. You, I just skip you, her songs. Wow. Yeah. But first of all. I wrote you ta- out. Let me, let me tell you something. Let me tell our listener something. Taylor thinks she's a Stevie, but she's a Christine, and it's a good thing. Wait, you say just, that again? Because I, I think you just that? melted my cerebral cortex. What did you say? Here's something I'm going to share with you, Chris, and with our listeners. No, you can. I heard you. But I want you to just repeat it. You don't have to pretend like I didn't hear you. I thought literally the recording <laughs> dropped out, and that was our producer, Joe, saying, tell Andy, just pretend nothing happened and reboot himself. Hit me again with the truth. Taylor thinks she's a Stevie, but she's actually a Christine. There's no and doubt about it. And now I kind of like, I can't even think about anything else. Okay. So that, that's it. I mean, there is no, no more hyperbole. This album is, and I'm going to quote a Chris Ryan G chat. This album is flames. It is flames. Yep. Yeah. Get, get, get the retardant suit out. <laughs> uh, let's wrap up a little bit this week talking about um, super depressing television. Yeah, let's take it down. Okay. So Chris, you, um, you did one of your, you, every, every few months, you just take a stroll around my corner. The kid scoops in. Yeah. Around my block. And, and you're all, you know what? You're always welcome. You're always welcome here. And uh, particularly when you write pieces like this, this piece you wrote last week I thought was really smart Thanks, and very man. perceptive. You wrote about the spate of British crime shows that we've been, some of them we've been talking about here, some of them you've seen, some of them I haven't seen. Um, one of them, Broadchurch, has been remade and is currently airing on Fox. It's Grace Point. And you basically wondered if there was a limit to our ability to watch people suffer the worst days of their lives. Yeah, so this came out of a conversation I had been having with my girlfriend about a couple of these shows where we started to notice a phenomenon that she actually coined the phrase bad news relay. It's a great phrase. Which is is basically the excruciating, drawn-out delivery of terrible information. Usually when a homicide detective comes to a family to inform that their child is either missing or dead, and, and um, we, the audience, it's worse when it's excruciating, particularly because we, the audience, know what's happened. Yes. And one and of the characters has the bad news. we are often treated to the banal goings on of their day to day lives yeah. before they find out about this, but we know. So recently, that you could say that the entire season of Leftovers was a bad news relay, but I'm speaking specifically about that flashback episode because everything in the flashback episode, once we've established that it is in fact a flashback and not whatever parallel universe. Everything in that flashback episode, you're just it's just like, I can't believe that, like, the daughter used to be so nice and now she's going to be so mad, you it, know, it, like it, all this it, stuff. It's, it's Titanic, the yeah. movie and the ship. Yeah. And so this is especially uh, a hallmark of some of these great British crime procedurals that Andy and I have mentioned over the course of the last 18 months or so, which is like Southcliffe and um, Happy Valley, Happy Valley, Broad Church. It actually happens in the fall a little bit. Um, falls, I couldn't get falls too hard for me. Yeah, there was um, like this Janet McTeer detective drama I remember a couple years ago, Five Days Missing or something like that. That's basically about like a, a woman that vanishes and there's tons of like, just like if you've got a, if there's any scene where there's like a press conference with the cops and the family, you know, like there's a bad news relay going on. And, it, and, it, and Southcliffe actually is only a four episode miniseries. I'd say half of it is a bad, bad news relay. Half of it is about people finding out coming to terms with and grieving over loss. And, and just to, as good as everyone says it is, I have not found the, the hole in my schedule where I'm like, I'm going to fill it with, with misery. I would recommend Southcliffe because it's extraordinarily well-directed. It's like True Detective good, good direction. The, well, you know how I felt about True Detective. Yeah, I know. But I kind of had this theory that basically like we've kind of reached the very far outer limits of what we can, sh- of, of keeping people interested in just the body. I mean, you had mentioned a couple of months ago or a couple of weeks ago when you wrote about the affair that like bodies were sort of the coal furnace of, of television. Like, yeah, this is just a couple of weeks you know, ago. you need like a corpse to get the plot going. There's and no, you know, you've got like things like it. Hannibal where like people are getting turned into human honeycombs 
you know, I, I mean, like this is we've got that far. Like that, the, the body crimes are, are as far as we can go, and now we're doing crimes of the heart. <laughs> Human honeycombs in just a span of a year have gone from Stefan's hottest club on NBC <laughs> to Hannibal on NBC. So I'm it. just like, I don't know, man. I I think that it's kind of uh, watching Grace Point. I've watched a couple episodes, right, and. Uh, it's very eerie because part of like the fir- most of the first episode and some of the second, it's kind of like the Gus Van Sant Psycho remake where you're just like, what is going on? Note for note. Yeah. yeah. But it's an it's interesting. So like you can make one argument that this is like theater and it can be done. It can have a variety of interpretations of the same script. I, I'm OK with that. But. The first time when you see Broadchurch, those notes that they felt very real and very emotional and you just kind of like your heart breaks for these people, even though they're fictional. The second time with Grace Point going through it and to have each moment play the same, it feels like that much more manipulative. And yeah. it just made me think about this entire tr- sort of subgenre and whether or not it's really playing on some of our darkest, darkest fears. Well, I think that the trick might be exposed at this point. You know, yes. I, I, I do. I, I think that my feelings about Broadchurch. I mean, I I would definitely recommend Broadchurch to people who haven't seen either. I certainly would recommend it over Grace Point. Um, but I really didn't like it nearly as much as I think you did. And and one of those reasons was because I, f- as as expertly as much of it was done, it did feel like, you know, it it felt like the it felt like the the, the car was very nice, but the roller coaster ride itself was very old. And so the way that every episode sort of hinged on that same sort of horrific churning in this this deathly inevitability of things um it is absolutely an effective way to mine audience emotions and often it can it can pay off i we we threw happy valley in there and it's and it's it's painful very painful at times but i think that it 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 handles itself and it allocates the agony in a way that is different than the sort of normal procedural since it's basically about a at once about an old case and wounds and a new case Mm -hmm. so there are ways to make it feel fresh and creative but you know, I, 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 it is kind of, it's, it's kind of a trick and it's a trick that a lot of British TV has been, has been, has been pulling. And since we've been pointing to British TV so often recently as a, as an exemplar of what TV can and should do and American TV can and should do, I hope they find, I hope they find a new one. Well, I should, we should point out that there's, so in England, I have to be like, you know, guys like in England, but in England, like there is that strange, it's a superpower, like a country that is sort of nominally a superpower, but it has very, very almost, almost like a village mentality. And when you read the newspapers there, like especially the tabloids, crime and especially crimes that happen to, you know, families in suburbs are still the sort of driving force behind those papers. And there's always on Twitter or in these, like the Daily Mail or the Sun or something like find Madeline, you know what I mean? Like it, there's always like a, a case of the moment that seems to be gripping the nation. Mm-hmm. And I think these shows are trying to tap into that a little bit. And I think those kinds of things don't often happen in America. I mean, like there was like that well, Casey, what's the, her face case. And I'm sure there's like listen, always a case uh, going. Um, America like, loves a missing white girl. There's no sure, question. About and that. so does England. I'm just saying that like, there's a sense of like, almost like it happened down the street in England because literally right, that, it did. I think that I think you've nailed it. And I think that's why Grace Point fails is because one of the things that was appealing and interesting about Broadchurch was the sense that this town of Broadchurch was a deeply lived in place mm-hmm. where the relationships between the people, all the characters knew each other in the small town was felt somehow plausible and established because they'd all lived there for years. And it felt quite, it felt real by by uprooting it and relocating it to a fictional town somewhere California ish, northern Pacific Northwest ish called Grace Point. Yeah. It's completely arbitrary and artificial. Yeah, it feels very much like Vancouver standing in as Northern California. It, it just could be anywhere with anything. It has no culture, no no um, speci- culture specific to it, and that's what you lose. I mean, and that and, and that just also gets back to a point we've made many times about why we like certain crime novels because the crime becomes tangential to the sense of place and the sense of community. Um, so, that said, I don't have that much hope that as these stories, whether they are adapted, um, you know note for note, word for word, shot for shot, like Broadchurch, or if they're more loosely adapted, um, I don't have that much faith that, that the U.S. audiences will, the U.S. the U.S. industry will get it right because they tend to lack that. I mean, that, that sense of place is the thing that only the greatest TV shows have and very few of them do. Yeah, for sure. You know what has a great sense of place? <laughs> what? 
New York. Welcome to New York, Taylor Swift. <laughs> Uh, it's been another fun week. We'll be back oh, next week. God, uh, the lights are so bright, but they never blind me here. I got it. Well, what are we going to talk about next week? Maybe we'll do a little bit of reader mail. If you guys want to keep sending in emails, it's Hollywood Prospectus Pod, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, Hollywood Prospectus Pod at gmail.com. You know what we're going to talk about next week? Uh huh. Side two of Taylor Swift's 1989. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I'll give me time to listen to it. And also oh, erasing oh, Christine Chris. McVie from all recordings of Fluid Mac. So many rough admissions made today. And let me tell you, his, when, when we look back on this, my love for this Taylor Swift album will be a, 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 a nothing, a blink in the eye of history compared to your negation of the goddess Christine McVie. I want you to take this one thing from, from the show, though. Mm -hmm. You're a great critic. Thanks, pal. It means a lot. <laughs> Talk to you later. <laughs> great job, McVie! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to Grantland. To hear more Grantland shows in your earballs, subscribe to Grantland Sports and Grantland Pop Culture on iTunes. Or go to grantland.com and click on Podcasts.